Welcome back to the Lamppost Listener. My name is Daniel. I'm Phil. And this is a podcast where we are journeying chapter by chapter through C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. This is chapter 11 of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Aslan is nearer. All right. Welcome back, Phil. Welcome back yourself. Yeah, man. I'm a, I'm a little nervous about today for two reasons. Uh, the first one is this Let's start is with ne- number two. <laughs> okay. The second one is I had... Uh, I visited the dentist today, and I got, uh, I think some- no, no, no. T- Tell him what really happened. <laughs> no, I really did. I went Someone to besmirched your honor, and you got in a fight, and you won, <laughs> no. but you, you didn't come away unscathed. I, I went to the dentist today and didn't realize I was going to be getting some anesthesia uh, in, my, in my gums, and I did, and so I feel- completely fine but if my words sound a little slurred to anyone or i have trouble getting some words out of my mouth i apologize but phil and i were we were so excited to dive into this book we didn't want to push it back any further so we apologize for any slurs that daniel makes got it oh uh, nope that's not what i said <laughs> or maybe it says that's not what i meant um <laughs> my the first thing then was this i'm going to be honest this has never been one of my favorite chapters of the book. So I know that's not a great place to start off. <laughs> Be like, yeah, I don't like this one. I, I do like it, but it has always been one of my least favorite chapters. And so as I was reading through this, I was trying to kind of put the, uh, you know, figure out what it is about this chapter that has maybe kept me from loving it as much as some of our previous chapters. Like, I mean, I loved the last chapter with, with uh, Father Christmas showing up. So, um, and I, I think I really have. I think I have figured out what it is, um, but I'm a little bit nervous because I know you know a, love, a lot of people love these books. Most of our listeners, I'm assuming, really enjoy these books. So I, I'm always a little hesitant to bring some criticism here, especially if it's just personal things like I think it's boring, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> because I don't upset anybody. Uh, but yeah, I think this chapter is kind of boring. So, so we're gonna get into that uh, here. Yeah, what are your overall thoughts about this chapter, Phil? Before we jump into our summary. Well, I do see where you're coming from. Um, I'm curious to see what exactly your points are because I was just looking over this before we started and I'm not sure how much new stuff was in this chapter, but you do kind of develop characters further and you find out a little bit more and you also get some really good dialogue. So I'm excited to try to sway you the other direction. Yeah. Yeah. And by, I don't, by no means is this a bad chapter or anything, um, and again, I, I will admit we are looking at this since we're doing it, you know, one chapter at a time. We're looking at this book in a very serialized format, which is not necessarily how it's intended to be read. It's not like you're supposed to, oh, finish the chapter. I got to put the book down and wait another week or two weeks, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, so we are kind of breaking it up into a very serialized format. Uh, but I, yeah, I think, yeah, I, I'm saying too much. Let's 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 get into the chapter. Um, we ended last episode with Father of Christmas arriving in Narnia. And in this chapter, we're going to kind of go back a little bit and take a look at uh, Edmund's journey with the White Witch. Do you have any thoughts about last episode before we go into the chapter summary? Oh, well, it was really fun having a guest on. I think oh, yeah. I did a really good job. And I'm excited to have more guests on in the future. I think we have a good lineup. Yeah, I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I know now people are going to be bored because it's just you and me here talking. And <laughs> why isn't Sarah Jane back with us? You know, um, so I have written the chapter summary for chapter 11. Uh, I'm going to jump right into it here. All right. Having just learned about the rest of Edmund's siblings, the White Witch sets out from her castle accompanied by the dwarf and Edmund. Edmund is treated poorly and left shivering and wet and tired as the sledge plows through the falling snow. On this journey, Edmund begins to regret his decision to betray his siblings. In the morning, they come across a merry band of Narnians enjoying breakfast together. The witch is befuddled by the joy in the food and is shocked to learn that Father Christmas has provided it. In a fiery rage, she turns the entire party into stone. Edmund appeals on behalf of the Narnians, but is treated to a strong blow from the witch for speaking up. As the sledge continues along, the journey becomes more and more difficult because of the decreasing amounts of snow. Finally, the dwarf acknowledges that spring has come to Narnia. Very well done. What is that, 148 words? Uh, it's right around there. I kind of I was, I had to do some trimming on this last night as I was working <laughs> on it. Like I was like at 160 some. I was like, oh, I got to take out some, some good stuff. So I, I kind of... Uh, jumped through some of the what's happening at the end of that chapter, um, but we'll definitely get into that here in our uh, our our read through. So, 
Bonus um, points for the word befuddled. You like that? Yeah, <laughs> no. that's pretty good. So we start this chapter. I've enjoyed the fact that these last couple of chapters have kind of been going back and forth in our narratives. Have you noticed that? Yeah, with you mean with one group and then it switches back yeah, to another yeah. group, back and forth, yes. Yeah, I really like that. The, you know, the first, I guess, eight chapters were just us following the Pevensies through Narnia. And then with chapter nine, we get Edmund's story going to the White Witch. In chapter 10, we kind of go back to uh, the rest of the Pevensies and the Beavers leaving. And now we're kind of going back to seeing it from Edmund's side. And I kind of like this, uh, especially within the structure of this book, because after this, just looking ahead just, just a little bit, um, we... We're going to eventually get go back to a very linear approach. So after this chapter, we're going to start seeing the, the narrative go in that linear approach that I just mentioned. And so I kind of like it here in the middle of the book. I think my Kindle says we're about in the 50, 60 percent, uh, percent of the way done that we get this kind of change up in the in style and in the way that we are um, introduced, not introduced at this point, but the way that we are engaging with the narrative. So I, I, I really like that. So I know I might be a little bit harsh about and are critical of this chapter, but I want to go ahead and get that out. I, I love the fact that Lewis is jumping back and forth between these two uh, stories. For sure. So let me share maybe what I'm bothers me a little bit about this chapter. Um, and that's kind of right here at the beginning. So Edmund, he's, he, I see, I think C.S. Lewis says he's in for a disappoint. He's having a most disappointing time. <laughs> And we learned I, that all. I wrote for my summary. Edmund is just having the worst day. Yeah, he just, really is. Sounds it's, miserable. It's all his fault, though. So you don't feel like too bad for him. Um. So he, Edmund is has believed, or at least made himself believe, that the White Witch is going to reward him. You know, he's going to be made prince, and he's going to get all. He's finally going to get that Turkish delight. And when he gets there, um, you know, the witch is horrible to him. She treats him horribly. And the dwarf at one point just brings him out dry bread instead of the Turkish delight. And I think when I was trying to figure out maybe why have I not enjoyed this chapter as much as other chapters, I think it's because you and I and the rest of our readers, we we know this, we knew this was gonna happen. We knew that this wasn't gonna go well for him. The only person that didn't know that the story was going to turn out this way is Edmund. It is solely Edmund who is surprised to find out that the witch is a witch, <laughs> you know? Right. And I, I think that's where uh, maybe some of the, the tension is taken out of uh, the story for me right here because I am not at all surprised to have this boy be treated poorly by a dwarf and the witch. And so, so I... I yeah, here's, what a, you say? here's a quick question for you. So just in terms of how sin works, it seems like you either have someone warn you not to do something before you can learn the hard way or you can learn the hard way. And he hasn't really had too much of a chance to be told. Like no one really knew that he knew the queen, but I do feel like he has been warned in some other ways, don't you? Yeah, I, that's a good question. I mean, he... You know, C.S. Lewis and most of this presenting Edmund is like, he does say at many points, he, well, he knew deep down, he knew deep down that this was the wrong thing to do or that he knew deep down that the White Witch was, uh, you know, not good, that she was evil. And it's not necessarily that, oh, he goes, oh, well, we know that all uh, White Witches that we come across in, you know, <laughs> magical forces are supposed to be bad, you know. Um, right. He definitely would have known it was wrong to lie. Edmund is old enough to know mm. that that's an inappropriate action to take. Um, so but, it seems like maybe, maybe he knew, but he let stuff that he wanted to get in the way. Yeah, I think that's it. And I think some of it could be, you know, his own conscience or like, you know, even just the uh, the Holy Spirit provoking him, right? That this is the, this is a, like, you're doing the wrong thing. Don't do this, right? Right. Uh, but I, I think you're right that there hasn't been like a time where anyone's, directly communicated to him, oh, she's, he, well, I guess, no, that's not true. He did hear that from the beavers, but he just, you know, you can't trust a beaver. We all know that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but so, I mean, I guess you're right that it, it's not, I think what we are discovering and what you're helping me discover is Edmund's, I take for granted because I know this story and I've read it so many times that you know, Edmund's kind of turn to the white witch's side here in the first part of this book is not necessarily just a really easy 
it's not just a simple, oh, he just, he's evil or, oh, he's, he's just joined the side of evil. Like it is much more complicated than that. And there have, but at the same time, there have been many chances for him to uh, bow out gracefully and, you know, join the good side. Right. But he's, he's not taking those. And, and the great thing is we do see him make those decisions in this chapter. But I, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question to ask. I'm glad you pointed that out. How do you feel about the beginning of this chapter? Well, and first of all, that is just the worst day. And he is kind of suffering some of the consequences for the choices that he made. I also think that just because no one said specifically not to do what he did, you're right in that he he knows not to lie. He knows not to do certain things. And he's kind of letting his own greed and his own pride get in the way. He wants to be king and he's you know, angry and he's like, he's letting all of that yeah. kind of control his behavior. And now we're seeing the result of that. Yeah. We're seeing, this is the, this is the consequences of his sin. Right. And yeah. And I love the details because the, the details are so powerful. Like when, when the witch gives him water and dry bread, <laughs> that's, that's just so messed up. And that's a great detail for her. And it's also like, it just kind of, if it was just like, okay, you don't get to eat anything, that wouldn't stick in your mind as much as, okay, not only do you get water and dry bread, but you have to eat it. Like she kind of coerces she makes him, him into yeah. eating it. Yeah. There's, Intimidates uh, him into eating it. Yeah, and I think that does tell us a little bit about the witch too. And I was going to say this for the end of the chapter, but let's talk about it now. One of the things I've been noticing as we really look at this book in depth is that C.S. Lewis doesn't really flesh out his evil characters very much. Um, I was actually listening to a um, a lecture given by a professor. I think it's at Gordon Conwell Seminary, uh, and I, I I really hope I get this right. Uh, I think the professor's name is Ryan Reeves, and he has a bunch of videos on YouTube. I'll definitely f- go back and find this video, and I'll link it in the description below. And he he has um. He does a big lecture series on Lewis and Tolkien. Tolkien. And in that series, he talks about, at one point, about uh, the way that both Tolkien and Lewis depict evil. And he was then comparing it to maybe some of the ways it's been depicted in uh, the adaptations of their books. And he talked about how, um, this is his opinion, was that one of his problems with the Lord of the Rings trilogy is that it focused too much on the bad guys. We see too much of Sauron. We see too much of Sauron. And he didn't say this. I don't remember. I haven't watched the video in a while, but I don't think he, he applies it to Narnia. But I think you could say the same thing, that actually the White Witch is, we get way more time and given, she's given more attention in the in the film than she is in the book. I mean, we can definitely say that because she appears in all three Narnia movies, <laughs> uh, despite her not needing to be in all of them. And one of the things it talks about is like both... Lewis and Tolkien were not as, he mentions them not being as focused on the evil characters. They aren't these like multifaceted uh, people with these complicated motives and, you know, Infinity War just came out recently and I'm not going to spoil it, but Thanos is, he's not just a simple evil character. There's actually a lot more going on there, or at least the writers are trying to to make us um, see that it's not just a, good versus bad, like, you know, Darth Vader in the original Star Wars, which is, you know, he, obviously he's developed more in the later films, but in, in the original, in 77, in the original Star Wars, he's just bad, right? And that's kind of how the White Witch is presented, even alongside the, kind of the dwarf here, and as we get further on into these books, a lot, of, not all, but a lot of the bad people are just simply bad people. And so I was realizing that as we spend time with with the witch and the dwarf in this chapter, I still really feel like I don't know them super well. And I don't say that as a critique because I don't think C.S. Lewis wants us to know them super well. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I saw that with, it's Fenris, correct? Am I saying that right? Uh, Well, we're going to call him Maugrim, uh, which is what he's in these. But remember, we talked about this, right? Fenris in the original American versions, but then it was changed back to Maugrim. Okay, well, I'm finally now understand. I'm Does your version say Fenris? What talking about. Listen, I'm reading the like original, like weird cover. I, I don't like the cover on this one. The Collier books. This is like the 1970 edition. Okay, what? You know that's not original then. <laughs> no, I know. You just I'm said just I'm saying. reading the original. <laughs> well, the like it's the original. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not reading the original. You're right. Yeah. Um. Yeah. 
I know not, copyright nineteen fifty, but this edition is nineteen seventy. Okay. But I now understand what that was about. I had no idea who Fenris was before. Yeah. Um, so f- we learned. Remember, we learned that Fenris was the Americ was uh, Malgram's aim in the original American versions. Because again, I guess we Americans always have to have it everything watered down for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like Harry Potter. From, yeah. But the time that all of our information gets across the Atlantic from uh, the UK, they've got to go ahead and, and water it down for us to be able to understand. <laughs> but, but then Who, that thing, who's responsible for that? Is, it has to end. It's the publisher's decision, I guess, right? I would assume the publisher. I, I don't know for sure, but I would assume the publisher. I wonder if there's like a publisher whisperer and they like go up to the publisher and they're like, listen, the American people are just are not going to understand what a modern is. You're going to have to change it to something like yeah. Fenris. <laughs> No kids are going to want to read a book that has philosophers in it. That's going to sound too smart. <laughs> yeah, too many, too many vowels. Yeah. So and yeah. So what anyway, were you saying though? He just bounds over. She's like, "Hey, come here," and he just bounds over. And she's like, "Go do this." He's like, "It'll be done," and that's it. Like, I, you know, nothing else about him. And from other, some of the other content that I've been taking in, just from movies and from books that I'm reading, everything is so much more developed than that. So that did stand out to me. Yeah, and I I'll definitely link the, the uh, Professor Reeves. I I think that's his name. Again, I'm not a hundred percent sure, um, but he he makes this point way better than you or I could. So I would recommend listeners going and checking out um, this video. But he kind of talks about how that was not Lewis's or even Tolkien in his in that example. That's not really their intention. So it's not necessarily like a, a bad thing. It's something they're very clearly trying to do. Mm. Um, but it's just something I noticed, and maybe why for me. I am much more used to a lot of uh, books and media and mo- especially movies is you know from the 21st century. M- maybe what I'm expecting is for all of my characters, good and bad, to be equally developed, and we're going to spend just as much time with the bad guys as with the good guys. And maybe that's not what um, Lewis is trying to do here, you know. Yeah, and it's refreshing. Have you read East of Eden? I have not. That's on my list, though. There's a character in East of, Eden, uh, East of Eden, and they are a bad character. They're just they're so evil, mm-hmm. and it's kind of nice sometimes to to not have and like a multi like not to have a lot of dimension to the characters. Like oh, they're kind of good and they're kind of bad. There's a place for all all types of different characters. Yeah, but it is kind of nice in this case that it's just they're bad and that's all there is to it. Yeah, I I, I think I'm actually really coming on to the idea of there just being a very clear. There's good and there's evil. You know, I, I actually, I really like that. I feel like we don't have that a lot, especially in movies, TVs, and books kind of written today. It's all kind of, the the trend is kind of, well, let's kind of make everything a little bit uh, in the middle or so. There's like, and I don't think it's a bad thing. Like, like I really enjoyed Infinity War for what it was. And, uh, and and Thanos was very much, yeah, I know you're, you've been talking about it nonstop, I feel like. <laughs> and I, uh, yeah, I, I really like that they did that with Thanos. So I'm not, I'm not kind of saying one's better than the other. I like the variety and the diversity we're getting in storytelling. We've so, got to move on though. Yeah. Or what are you going well, to say? Speaking of the wolves, um, she, she goes, take your fastest ones to the house. She's like, kill anything there and then meet me at the place, but stay out of sight. Mm-hmm. Meet, meet me at the stone table, but stay out of sight. Why does she send them there? She, uh, she's like, if they're still there. I and mean, there's no way they're still there, but she still sends them there. Why do you think she does that? Maybe she's thinking Mrs. Beaver is going to just keep getting all that sewing machine <laughs> stuff. And she's like, I got her. Uh, right. I, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, wolves are much faster than uh, people and beavers are. So maybe she's hoping that they'll outrun them, you know? And yeah. it, there's a good chance, because we know as readers that the, that our, uh, our heroes, if you will, they are hiding at this point, probably in the that beavers, you know, their hideout. But if they had continued just to walk, there's a very good chance that Maugrim and the rest of the wolves could have caught up with them. So mm-hmm. I think maybe that's where, where she's going with that. I see that. Yeah. So let's let's move on because we are we're already going kind of long here. We we're like yeah. in the first two pages of the chapter. Um, I want to do some reading here because there's a lot of wonderful description. I think C.S. Lewis's voice really shines in this chapter. And so I want to read about this trip that the the dwarf and Edmund and the White Witch go on. Okay? Let's hear it. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer, and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat. Before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow, He soon stopped trying to shake it off because, as quickly as he did that, 
a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things he had said to make himself believe that she was good and kind, and that her side was really the right side, sounded to him silly now. He would have given anything to meet the others at that moment, even Peter. The only way to comfort himself now was to try and believe that the whole thing was a dream and that he might wake up at any moment. And as they went on hour after hour, it did come to seem like a dream. This lasted longer than I could describe even if I wrote pages and pages about it. But I will skip on to the time when the snow had stopped and the morning had come and they were racing along in the daylight. And still they went on and on, with no sound but the everlasting swish of the snow and the creaking of the reindeer's harnesses. Oof, that's good. Oh, that's C.S. Lewis. What a, what an incredible author. I lo- I mean, you can just picture that so favorite, well. Favorite thing that he did right there is he saved everybody some time and didn't write pages <laughs> and pages. But he said, if I did write pages and pages, it still wouldn't be enough. And what he's communicating is it's a really long amount of time. Yeah. And everyone least, knows what that feels like. Like, oh, this is longer than I can like possibly imagine going any further than this. But he does it in such an efficient way and kind of like winking at the audience. Yeah, it's a it's a really great fourth wall break. And I think C.S. Lewis has done such a great job throughout this book at, at timing those perfectly. Like, I think if it was too much, it would just feel like, uh, I think it would really break down the, I don't know, what am I, how am I trying to say it? It would really make me less engaged with the story if I go, oh, this is just all some made up thing, right? It doesn't let me get really invested if he keeps breaking the fourth wall, but he does it just enough where it 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 works so well. It actually he's doing this fourth wall break to communicate, you know, how long of a time it's been. So it actually his him taking me out of the story actually puts me deeper into the story. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, that's that's well said. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So here, this is where Edmund and the dwarf and the witch come across this party of Narnians eating breakfast. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, one of my favorite things, so I know you don't like this chapter as much, but one of my favorite things that happens in the entire book um, is in this scene where they're at the table. So they're having this feast, and we find out when the queen, or when the white witch asks them, uh, what's the meaning of all this? And they tell her that... um, Father Christmas provided all this stuff. And they're just, they're celebrating. They obviously have this great hope for the future because they know what Father Christmas being there means. And then she just stops right there. And one of the, is it a fox that's in the middle of a toast? Uh, Yeah, it's the fox. Yeah, so the fox is, you know, has his arm up, I imagine, holding a glass. And he's like right in the middle of a, he's about to say something. And then he sees her and just, it's like that horrible drain, like, drain all the blood from your face yeah. terrible emotion and they're like oh no and she she also like kind of gives them a chance like she's like lie to me tell me that this isn't what's really happening and even now i'll forgive you and there's a split second and then that little squirrel just loses oh his no head. <laughs> he's like he was he was he was and it's just like oh no and like and then everyone gets turned to stone yeah it's it's a great scene, and this really shows kind of the the evilness of the witch. You know what I mean? Like this is a group of people just having fun, but just the mere and it really shows how terrified she really is. Yeah. Right. Like she's. I mean, she's. She just hears the name Father Christmas, which is not even the name Aslan. She hears Father Christmas, and just his relation to Aslan is what scares her, as what I'm assuming. Right. Right. And so that and what it, what it means, the meaning behind it. Yeah, it means that spring is probably coming, or at least that the whole idea of having it be always winter and never Christmas is is over. Yeah. One of the questions I have for you, Phil, is in this section we hear that there's the uh, the squirrel and his wife and their kids and the two satyrs and the dwarf and an old uh, dog fox are all on stools around the table, which made me wonder, are all of the animals bipeds in Narnia? I know. I mean, I think back to the movies, like the the Disney adaptation, and they're definitely like the fox and the you know, the dogs or squirrels. They all, you know, walk around the same way that they do in our world, right? So the dogs and the fox is on four legs. Is 
it, I'm trying to picture the fox sitting at a table on the stool. You know what I mean? Like, is the are, are they holding up goblets with their paws? Like what? You know what I mean? I wish Pauline Baines had an ill. Oh wait, she actually she does, doesn't she? She does Don't have look. an illustration. So on, uh, if any of our readers are reading along uh, with us, I'm on page 117 of at least of my book, and the fox is there. I'm looking at it now. The fox is on two legs, seated on a stool, and is holding up the goblet with the uh, with one of his hands. So there you go. I have so many copies of this book, and I don't have all the cool illustrations you do. You still don't have it in that one? We should uh, put my PayPal in the show notes. <laughs> so I can, can you, yeah. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll, for readers, I'll go ahead and also link that or sorry, for listeners, I'll go ahead and link that picture down in the description below too so you can take a look at that. It's a really, I mean, we, we, we talk about her all the time because her illustrations are wonderful for these books. It's a really, really spectacular illustration and it very much is something different than what is communicated through the adaptations. And again, I'm realizing how much the, the Disney and the BBC adaptations have really um, influenced the way that I picture these books in my head, you know? For sure. I think I was influenced for that particular scene that you're asking about by Zootopia because a fox is walking around the entire movie. Oh, yeah. So, so that's what I was picturing. And I'm actually picturing Jason Bateman, <laughs> you know, face doing, you know, I'm picturing him doing the voice. When they when they remake the uh, line, the witch, in the wardrobe in like in 20 years, that's who you think is going to be the, the voice they get. <laughs> Not in 20 years. but I like mean, if they, if they remade it now and if it was animated, I think it would be Jason Bateman. As okay. Fox. OK. I don't I mean. Or sure, George, why not? George Clooney, maybe, because of uh, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then all the dogs could look like all the dogs did in Isle of Dogs. We'll get like Bill Murray and Edward Norton to uh, <laughs> to voice the dogs. And Owen Wilson and all yeah. all the greats. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, I would totally see that. Oh, I would too. Absolutely. And Wes Anderson directed a lo- a uh, a Narnia movie. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, Especially, if Quentin like, Tarantino is going to do Star Trek, ugh. then Wes Anderson can do Narnia. No, okay, that's the rules. I'm gonna. S- yeah, I'm gonna keep it to literature. So I'll just. I'm trying sigh. to trigger Daniel. Uh, <laughs> um, there's one important line I, w- I want to read. Just one sentence here, and I think it's probably the most important sentence in this book. I mean, sorry, in this chapter, and maybe one of the most important sentences in the entire book. And let me go even further. All right, maybe one of the most important sentences in the first three books. So I'm talking. Wardrobe, wow. Caspian, and don't you, you know, let's say this. Maybe one of the most important sentences ever written by any human. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we'll just keep making it bigger and better. Um, here's the sentence. You sound like um, a character in Guardians of the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is, it, is, is it still the greatest sentence ever? Uh, never it was. never was. It's <laughs> And Edmund, for the first time in this story, felt sorry for someone besides himself. Boom. Yes. Absolutely. I, lo- I love the turning point there. And I, I really do believe this is Edmund's turning point in the story. I think from here on out, Edmund is now, he you know, if you kind of view this as, as like a graph, you kind of been just going lower and lower, making poorer and poorer decisions. And even though this, you know, this decision is just him speaking up against the Narnians, like speak up for the Narnians. He's advocating for the Narnians here. Uh, and for the first time, he feels sorry for someone besides himself. He has empathy. He has empathy for someone. Right. And I think it's and, also... And the don't, don't, don't that he says right before. He's like, he's like don't, don't, don't. And yeah. then she does it anyway. And then he starts to feel sorry for someone besides himself. It's it's almost like the don't, don't, don't. I almost read it as being like it's instinctive of him. It's not like he's, it's not like him giving this long, you know, I don't... It's not, it's not Darth Vader looking at Luke and the Emperor in Return of the Jedi and just like, huh, I wonder yeah. which, you know, this is just, oh, no, please don't do that, right? Yeah. This is something he's like, it's something deep within him. It's like he he knows intrinsically that this is wrong. And so I, th- and that's, I think that's a big, big deal here. And I think that shows us that although Edmund has made many, many poor decisions, he's not deep down evil, right? He might deep down be broken, right? Original sin here. He is broken and in his sin, he wants to turn away from Aslan, but there, like he does know clearly what's right and what's wrong, and I think that goes back to what C.S. Lewis often talks about in *Mere Christianity*. He, you know, I don't remember a lot of the words he uses, but he, he talks about there being a very like there are universal rights and wrongs, 
even if we don't, you know, say them out loud, like we all acknowledge that murder is wrong. Like in, and yeah. C.S. Lewis is, is arguing um, from an apologetic standpoint that, look, that, that proves that at least something has made us all decided that, that murder is wrong, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think this is really important. What are, what are your takeaways from that sentence? Well, from the, the don't, don't, don't part, we see that Edmund has, hesit- like, he, he's not even hesitating. He's, like you said, instinctively being like, no, don't do this. Because he knows what's going to happen. The witch does not hesitate at all. Oh, no. You can tell from the timing and the way he wrote it. It's like the witch raises her wand and boom. She doesn't go like, oh, you know, you know, I've turned so many things to stone. What's the point? She's just like, she does it. So she's clearly just 100% evil. Um, and then I also love that he's no longer thinking about himself. And it makes you think, okay, well, is he headed in the right direction now? Did he bounce once he hit rock bottom? Like, he certainly hope so. Yeah, and I think th- this time I'm now, f- if I'm reading this for the first time, and I'm thinking particularly if I'm one of my students, you know, nine, ten years old reading it for the first time, maybe I'm actually starting to root for Edmund. Or maybe I'm not that far yet. Maybe I'm getting to the point where I could see, wait, may- maybe Edmund isn't a bad guy, right? Because, I mean, if you're... With my students, as we're reading these books, usually Edmund is is a jerk. Like we, lot, he's a jerk face. They don't want to, you know. No one's really rooting for Edmund at this point. He betrayed his family, right? Yeah. And so maybe this is kind of planting that first seed of maybe Edmund can be redeemed, right? And so I I, I really believe this is a deeply important uh, part of the story, especially for Edmund's character and knowing where Edmund's character goes in Prince Caspian and in Voyage of the Dawn Treader. I think this is a huge turning point. Uh, f- for that entire character. For sure. So let's move forward. So after all that happens, C.S. Lewis writes this. Now they were steadily racing on again, and soon Edmund noticed that the snow which splashed against them as they rushed through it was much wetter than it had been all last night. At the same time, he noticed that he was feeling much less cold. It was also becoming foggy. In fact, every minute it grew foggier and warmer, and the sledge was not running nearly as well as it had been running up till now. At first he thought this was because the reindeer were tired, but soon he saw that he couldn't, that couldn't be the real reason. The sledge jerked and skidded and kept on jolting as if it had struck against stones, and however the dwarf whipped the poor reindeer, the sledge went slower and slower. There also seemed to be a curious noise all around them, but the noise of their driving and jolting and the dwarf shouting at the reindeer prevented Edmund from hearing what it was, until suddenly the sledge struck so fast that it wouldn't go on at all. When that happened, there was a moment's silence, and in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly, a strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he'd heard it before. If only he could remember where... Then all at once he did remember it was the noise of running water. Man, what what a fantastic passage. It sure was. Have you read The Giver? Uh ba- I have I have not read it since I was a child, so, and I can barely remember it. Uh, I'm gonna spoil it, so <laughs> turn your turn your headphones off if you don't want that book spoiled. That's fine. It's been out since the nineties. Um or maybe even before, there's a scene in The Giver where the character is trying to describe seeing something different than she's ever seen it before, or he has seen it before, and it's color. And I loved how that was done, and I think this is great too, because you're like, what What in the world is a clattering? <laughs> like, what is this noise of describing? And then you realize that it's water. Um, just very well done. And that's not something you really see very much, like, we see, we know what water sounds like because we hear it all the time. Running water. Yeah, I also think it, it's not a coincidence that, as you know, all of this again, Aslan's name is not spoken at all in this chapter. I don't believe it's almost kind of like the Book of Esther, where like we we don't we don't hear God, but He's everywhere in the story. And I I feel it that way. It's like Aslan isn't mentioned. Well, I, to the end. I, I guess we definitely hear his name at the end. He hasn't been mentioned yet, but every single passage like every long descriptive passage like that is just screaming Aslan's name and I don't think it's a coincidence that uh, C.S. Lewis uses running water to be 
the image or the, or the sound that Edmund hears that really signifies Edmund's now figured out that this is spring. And I, I mean, I think you point back to, to, to Jesus in the book of John, you're saying like, I'm, you know, he promises living water, right? I mean, like we think about water with baptism. Like it's a very, I really think there's a, there's a connection there. I don't think it was just a, any kind of coincidence. I, I really think Lewis is that brilliant of an author. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then they continue moving forward and, it says Edmund's heart gives a great leap and I, when he realizes that the frost was over. And I just have to point out, as a teacher on the East Coast, I can't uh, relate to that at all of being happy to see all the snow melting and us, our snow days going away. Every, when, I, when I read that, I'm like, oh, I, I don't know what that's like to be happy to see all the snow melting and having our snow days ending. I did not know what you were going to say at the end of that sentence. I thought you were going to say that people don't leap. East Coast. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. just it's a very serious society. Yeah, <laughs> we don't not, do that. Not like the West Coast. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to point that out. Anything else before we get to the end of this chapter? So, one thing I'm curious about is there's a lot of names of plants right at the end. Okay. It does Edmund know what all these plants are called? <laughs> I think C.S. It... Lewis knows what all the plants are called. <laughs> okay. I think they... I need to go back and look at look at those plants because he put it in there for a reason. It was like the third one. I was like, okay, I need to I need to know what these plants look like. But it, it also it gives it a, an amount of detail we're not used to seeing from Lewis, which is nice. So speaking of uh, those plants and flowers, why don't you read that passage that you have there? Okay. Every moment, the patches of green grew bigger and the patches of snow grew smaller. Every moment, more and more of the trees shook off their robes of snow. Soon, wherever you looked, instead of white shapes, you saw the dark green of firs or the black prickly branches of bare oaks and beeches and elms. Then the mist turned from white to gold and presently cleared away altogether. Shafts of delicious sunlight struck down onto the forest and overhead you could see the blue sky between the treetops. Yeah, that's a wonderful passage. And now we're not even getting the descriptions of this the winter falling away we're now getting descriptions of the spring bursting forward you know mm. yeah. do you have the i guess you probably don't either do you don't have the uh any of the illustrations here of the different plants no i just have illustrations man. of the beginning of each chapter oh man you're missing out uh but yeah i i really do enjoy that and the and just Hearing Lewis's voice, okay, maybe I, maybe you are changing my mind a little bit. Uh, hearing Lewis's voice come through so strongly, especially in his descriptive language. I mean, this is what makes Narnia Narnia. This is why we want to go there is because of the beautiful descriptions of this place. And and we're definitely getting that in full force here. We're also just now seeing Narnia, right? I mean, we've seen it in the winter, which I think was still beautiful, but there was this kind of air of evil over it. So, yeah, I think we're finally seeing what maybe Narnia is intended to be. So here at the end of the chapter, the dwarf realizes what's happening. And he says, this is spring. And then he says, this is Aslan's doing. And the witch ends it by saying, if either of you mentions that name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. And that's where we end the chapter. I'm like, such a strong note right there. Oh, man. I, I just love I don't I don't think she even looked. I imagine her just looking off to the side. Mm-hmm. She knows what he's going to say before he says it and he says it anyway and she just doesn't even look. She just keeps looking off into the distance, calculating her plan and then says, "If either of you mention that name again, he shall be killed." Yeah, just it's so cold. It's really intense and I think it shows it shows both how angry and how evil she is but also how deeply terrified and insecure she is like she knows this is bad for her and she's trying to kind of put on that sense of uh strength in order to uh kind of cover up that fear what do you what would you uh maybe this isn't a good question to ask someone who's read the books 27 times but (laughs) what what do you think is her plan right now and also why is she keeping edmund in the dwarf alive like she could just walk to the stone table right Uh uh-huh um so I it's unclear if the dwarf is her slave or not. She calls him. She says, like, are you my counselor or my slave? When he is trying to figure out how to get through all of the, uh, mm. like, the mud and the slush and stuff. It's unclear if she's, if she's just saying, calling him her slave or if he actually is a slave. Because, um, again, like we mentioned earlier, we don't 
get a ton of motivation for the dwarf. Like, we don't even get a name for him. I think they gave him a name in the movies, but I don't know if he has a name. He's not named in the text itself here. It's, I don't know. I Why she's keeping him around, I think, just to help. As far as Edmund, she has a reason, and it, it definitely comes up when she arrives at Aslan's camp. Since you're not reading that far ahead, I, I won't... She definitely has a plan. That's all I'll say. She does have a plan for Edmund. She knows... Uh, he's a pawn in her plan. I'll just say that. Okay. Yeah. Have you read it all ahead or have you stopped here at chapter 11? I'm one chapter ahead at least. Maybe, okay. Maybe two. Um, I think I'm one chapter ahead right now. Yeah, I think it's in chapter maybe 13 or 14, probably 13, uh, which is I think Deep Magic from the Dawn of Time. I think that's where you're going to kind of hear why she has Edmund, but I, I won't say any more for you. Okay. Yeah. So, Phil, where do we end with this chapter? Just kind of to, to sum all this up, where are we? Yeah, the dwarf realizes this is no thaw. The white witch threatens immediate disintegration if they say that word again. <laughs> yeah. And um, we're going to move right on to chapter 12. Yeah, so next week, not next week, in two weeks, we'll be back with chapter 12, which is Peter's first battle. And it, oh, man, this is a great chapter. In this chapter, the Pevensies arrive at Aslan's camp. So I am really excited for this. Any last thoughts, Phil, before we wrap up this episode? Well, one thing I noticed while I was reading this, um, so I read it, I read this particular chapter at least once, maybe twice before, and then I read it once more, um, so maybe a total of three times. And I found that I really wanted to keep going, and it was actually a struggle to not keep reading further than just one additional chapter because I was prepping for multiple um, episodes just in case, but I'm really kind of getting into the story now and it it's literally a page turn yeah it's great and i think from my thoughts into this chapter although it's still not my favorite i'm now i think you have convinced me a little bit with sharing some of the things that you love about this chapter i'm i'm not like oh i'm sad when i have to read this chapter in the book i'm it's i like that it's a little different i like that it's less dialogue heavy and more descriptive and seeing narnia around it so you've convinced me a little bit excellent mission accomplished you can follow us into the world of Narnia on our Facebook and Twitter pages, and you can also send us an email at thenarniapodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for those of y'all who have been reaching out, who have just been uh, sharing some of your thoughts and feelings about the book. We really do appreciate that, uh, and it's, it's been a really fun way for us to kind of engage with the listeners. So continue to please to do that. We really, really do appreciate that. Speaking of things we'd appreciate, we'd also appreciate a review uh, on an Apple podcast because it helps other people find the show. You can also make sure that you're subscribed to our show in your favorite podcast app so you can wake up with a new episode every other Wednesday. Our show's themes were created by Kevin McLeod, and you can find more of his work in the links in the episode's description. Thank you so much for coming along on this journey, and we will be back next time for Chapter 12. All right, well, thank you, Phil and Daniel of the past. It is us again from the future. Welcome back, Phil. It's been a while, right? A couple of, probably about 10 seconds. Yeah, or no time at all. Yeah. So we are back, listeners. Um, we have some listener feedback we wanted to get to, and we still haven't quite figured out uh, kind of how to do this with the way that we've been recording episodes. So you have to bear with us a little bit as, as we still figure it out. But we just had so much good stuff that we wanted to kind of unpack that here at the end of this episode. Um, and I'm actually going to start us off. So our first bit of listener feedback is from friend of the show, David Bates, over from the Eagle and Child podcast. And we have a voicemail for him. So I'm going to play that now. Hey, guys, it's David from the Eagle and Child podcast. I just want to leave you a message to say that I'm loving the show. And actually, this weekend, uh, C.S. Lewis Book Club here in San Diego, we're about to start The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I also wanted to reach out and share with you something that I came across a little while ago, and it's about the relationship between Jesus and Aslan. Because it turns out, when the books were published, a concerned mother wrote to Lewis on behalf of her son, because he was afraid that he loved Aslan more than he loved Jesus. And Lewis wrote this reply. Lawrence can't really love Aslan more than Jesus, even if he feels that's what he is doing. For the things he loves Aslan for doing and saying are simply the things that Jesus really did and said. So when Lawrence thinks he is loving Aslan, he is really loving Jesus. 
and perhaps loving him more than he ever did before. And towards the end of the letter, he offers this beautiful recommendation. He says, if I were Lawrence, I'd just say in my prayer something like this. Dear God, if the things I've been thinking and feeling about those books are things you don't like and are bad for me, please take away those feelings and thoughts. But if they are not bad, then please stop me from worrying about them. And if Mr. Lewis has worried any other children by his books or done them any harm, then please forgive him and help him never to do it again. Adorable. <laughs> Keep up the good work, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye. <laughs> That's amazing. Isn't that really great? It started off really good and then got even better. I, I love that. That, that. that sentence, if Mr. Lewis has worried any other children by his books or done them any harm, then please forgive him and help him never to do it again. It's just one of the many, many reasons why I love C.S. I mean, you just hear his voice coming through that so strongly. You sure do. I would love to read a collection of Lewis's letters. They're, they're great. I would highly recommend go for our listeners to check out his letters. You and, have the actual letters? Yeah, I have his. No, this is actually true, man. I have um, at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, they have a couple of Lewis's actual books, not ones that he wrote, but books from his own personal library. And Anna and I were down there once a couple of years back, and we got to go through some of his books that had his own writing, like like Whoa. scrolled along the edges. It was the and we got to touch it. Like Big they let trip. us touch it with our like hands. I mean, not obviously our hands, but like we didn't have to wear gloves or anything. Just like, yeah, just don't break it, please. And I was like, you guys are, I just wow. trusting me not to like you know get my sweat on this. I was it was really cool. Man, well, I would have loved to see him before they were destroyed by you. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> <Your fingerprints. laughs> I promise. I gave them back in uh, as great of condition as I found them in. It was. It's a really cool thing. So that was. No, I've never seen any of his own writing. Well, I guess in that way I have seen his own writing because it was his notes all uh, scribbled along the, the side. Yeah. yeah, so thanks so much for sending us that, David, for that voicemail. And David yeah, also um, he also gave us another little piece of insight, especially regarding the, the Holy Spirit in Narnia. And he just he sent us this short message and, and said... Concerning the Holy Spirit in Narnia, I'd say that you don't have any especially obvious parallel in the Narnia stories, except once in a later book, and even then it's somewhat blurred with the person of Aslan himself. And I, I'm assuming you don't, that you, Phil, are not familiar with what he's talking about? I am not, yeah, I'm lost on that one. Yeah, I, well, I, there's a really great stuff that we'll obviously get to in the future, and I think that actually transitions us into another listener email we got that discusses the Holy Spirit. Do you want to read that one there? I do, but I also want to clarify the reason I I am lost is not because it's completely out of context. I just haven't read those books yet. Yeah, sorry. Yes, yes. For any new listeners, yeah, just in case anyone needs a reminder, Phil and I both consider ourselves Narnia novices. The only difference is I have read all the books, uh, almost all the books as an adult, where Phil has has been kind of just going with us chapter by chapter. So it's not that Phil is confused by what David is saying. <laughs> Any words over five characters? Well, you know, he put favorite there with a U, and so I wasn't quite sure what he meant. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right, do you want to read that email, bud? Yeah, we have an email from Ricky. He says, I really enjoy your podcast. I'm a big fan of Narnia. Keep up the good work. A few thoughts. Peter Kreft who wrote the book you mentioned in the Chapter 9 podcast, Between Heaven and Hell, is a wonderful resource on C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and has a lot of great podcasts on Lewis. Just thought I would throw his name out there since he mentioned his book. So thanks for that. We'll definitely check that out. And uh, point number two from him was, you mentioned seeing the Father and the Son in Narnia, but we're wondering where slash if the Holy Spirit is in the books. One thought I had of the Holy Spirit, and this could be a stretch, is when Aslan breathes on the stone statues in the witch's castle, and brings them back to life. There are also times throughout the books where Aslan breathes on people and his breath gives them peace or sleep or takes away fear. Just the thought I had when you asked about the Holy Spirits in the book, so I figured I would at least mention it and the idea of Aslan breathing on people. God bless and keep up the good work. So thanks for that, Ricky. Uh, I think that's a really cool point about the uh, Holy Spirit. What do you think? I, I really like that. And I also like that it's a little... If, if I'm kind of thinking about what David was mentioning before, it's a different kind of take on what the Holy Spirit 
could be in Narnia. And I like that there's different interpretations of that. Um, I, I really, I've, I've actually never thought of it as the idea of um, Aslan's breath, which does play a significant role, not just in this book. So I, I really love that, Ricky. Thanks so much for, for sending that, that email out. The because more, that's The more I think about it, the more I'm like, of course that's it. So that, you know, maybe that'll change over time, but um, I think that's a really good point. Okay, well, I have another email here. This one's from Robert, and he started off, he shared a lot of great information with us. He told us about a new uh, Narnia commentary that had just been released called Further Up and Further In. Um, he mentioned uh, about Lewis's red brick home, the Kilns. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but I'm probably not, actually. So, um, Which I actually wasn't extremely familiar with, but I've been reading a lot about Lewis's home. I, it looks like a lot of people are able to go visit that and stuff. Um, another field trip yeah exactly um and so he just sent us some great information and i will link some of that in the description uh below but he left us with two really great or uh, three really great comments and i wanted to read those out loud and kind of hear what you thought about them phil so and all three are regarding our last episode chapter 10 uh, where father christmas comes and visits the pevensies so here's what he had to say I, too, thought cordial a la Mrs. Beaver. You know, talk, He's talking about the argument we had last episode about what, what's in there. He said, slightly more genteel than home-brewed ale and with a bit more alcohol than be- beer or ale since it stung the back of the throat. However, a hard cider could achieve the same effect, although always winter would then, then also mean a hundred year with no fruits. Sounds a little bit biblical, no? <laughs> then again, there's also something to be said for it having been mead. The second thing he asked was, he wrote, one does wonder what Edmund's gifts would have been had he stayed. Uh, he even points out perhaps maybe Father Christmas just gave him a lump of coal or had it waiting for him for a, a delivery later on. And I have to ask you, Phil, do you have any idea what Edmund would have gotten or any guess? Or do you think he just would have gotten nothing? And there's no telling what is in there. <laughs> if he can pull a piping hot thing of tea out, maybe that was for Edmund, probably not. Um, but I... I would think it would have to do with food. You think? I, for Edmund, definitely. Maybe Turkish Delight. <laughs> Maybe the, Turkish the, Delight. The, the I feel like it wouldn't be Turkish Delight. Uh, it wouldn't be that Turkish Delight. Yeah, there That's you go. That's the first thing he thinks of. He's probably mentioned it before. And so the last thing that um, Robert points out is um, talking about when we talked about um, the quote where wars are ugly when women fight. Um, he wrote this really great uh, sentence that I wanted to share because I thought it was kind of what I was trying to say, I think, through my ideas, um, but I don't know if I communicated it well. So he wrote this. Something else to bear in mind is that this story is a British cultural product, and like a good anthropologist, we should take care when sharing in that cultural exchange not to rigidly insist on superimposing our own norms without benefit of a well-researched context. I thought that was a really great uh, summation of what we were trying to kind of get to at the end of the last episode, which is that, yeah, this is a, this is a different time. And so I think you and Sarah Jane and I all had slightly different takeaways from that, but it is important to remember that C.S. Lewis is not writing this in 2018 when we're recording this. Uh, That's a, that's a really good point too. And I I think we'll definitely have to bear that in mind, especially when we get to uh, some other parts of the books too, that might kind of um, spark similar conversations. So thanks so much for those great thoughts, Robert. We we really appreciate that. Yeah, thanks, Robert. All right, Phil, you want to do the last one? Sure. So we have a, one more email from Josh, and he says, Hey, Daniel and Phil, just recently found your podcast. I'm a huge fan of Narnia and try to read the books at least once a year. I love the way you dig deep into the books and see to try to understand what all is going on and how the books speak to you. I know you mentioned that after this first season, you're going to watch the movie slash movies. Obviously, there are multiple versions and see how it lined up with the books. I was wondering, are you going to do a podcast after watching the movie and talk about how you felt it compared to the book? I think that would be great. Looking forward to listening to all the podcasts and all the future podcasts. Keep up the great work. So, yes, we are definitely going to do a podcast about the movies. That's one of the things we're looking most forward to and i think we even have a special guest coming don't we daniel yeah well uh we ha- we're not going to reveal all of our guests we do have some guests that will be joining us especially in some uh it's aslan 
No, yeah, it's him. Uh, Liam Neeson's going to be with us. Um, oh we God. got him. Yeah, it was hard. We have we did to pay him fifty dollars for every <laughs> second that he's on the show. No, um, for every every letter that he says, it's going to cost us a dollar. I have so many questions for him that don't have to do with Narnia. <laughs> Why did Qui Gon Jinn die so quickly? Right. <laughs> Why? What why, are midichlorians? <laughs> why did you sign on for the movie without reading the script? Oh, um, yeah, I'm so glad he did though. <laughs> but so, also, just to, what's going to happen in Taken Five? <laughs> to give listeners a little bit of insight into our plans, they are not completely set in stone, but we do plan actually with the schedule we're rolling on right now. We will finish the book on Halloween of this year, on October 31st, 2018. And we'll take a somewhat extended hiatus, not too long. We're thinking between two or three months off. We'll kind of be getting ready for Prince Caspian and and getting some guests lined up and trying just to get ahead a little bit. But during that time, we, we, we do plan on releasing kind of two episodes over that break. One will be us discussing the BBC adaptation and one will be us discussing the Disney adaptation. And we definitely would love a lot of listener feedback in those. We'd love to hear people's experience with them. Uh, we'll share you know, our experience with them and definitely kind of compare them to the books, things that we liked about them, things we didn't like about them. But that, that's the plan for now is that we'll, we'll finish the book. We'll then talk about those two adaptations, and then we'll probably be back in about two to three months or so. That's a good plan. Yeah. Uh, Phil, do we have any last things or is that it? That's it. Well, great. Thank you all so much for sticking around. If you've made it all the way to the end, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. When Phil and I started this, we did not think so many people would care. And so uh, this has been really great. It's to have... really nice that this many people care. And from this many different places, too. We well, have and... a, a sense of like where everybody is from just based on like where the downloads are going. And oh, man, that's great. And I think we've both learned so much, I would say more through our listeners than even through our own research. And we have been trying to do a significant amount of research for each episode, but we've just learned so much through all of y'all. You know, we are definitely the people, uh, we are definitely the novices up here. Our, y'all, our listeners know so much more uh, than we do. And you guys have been so gracious in extending and sharing that knowledge with us. So thank y'all so much. We really do appreciate it. And please keep your thoughts, your insights, your opinions and your knowledge coming. We do appreciate it, and we'll see you next time.